same exact engine they were even using it in their in the Formula race cars and selling the engine to racers that wanted to use it in their race cars. So that's how it started, and that's and then I, I built one out of stuff I had around in my shop. Got a couple of gears, and did this and all, and just to see if it would fly, and it flew. And then the next thing was fulfilling the promise of doing it better than ever before and to be more professional, having a better engine than anybody else. So now I'm taking on Rotex <laughs> in my own mind. So I'm thinking, there's no reason I can't do it. And I, did, and I said, you know, the, the Rotex is a development engine that grew and got better and better and had its share of problems and so forth. The Jabiru engine, same thing, came out with Lots of automotive parts, cranks, pistons, piston rings, and some homemade cylinders. Somebody was machining over in Australia as their first one. And then it, it evolved from there. You got more fins, more cooling, more this, more that, and eventually it became a usable engine. Um, and uh, so forth and so on. So then, now I'm thinking, okay, I've got this Honda block, what to do? So I implement all the latest in technology. Number one was to scan the whole engine, digitize everything, so that I would have a file in my computer of where every, every hole was, every bracket, everything that was going to be machined and mounted to that engine would be in my computer. So no more being in the shop and eyeballing and sanding a bracket and making a bracket for the oil cooler and this and that. The whole engine, nothing was even touched. Everything was built in the computer. And if you, the brochure we have down in our, um, our display, you'll see now the real engine in front of you at our airplanes. But the picture on the brochure, if you look at it, it's not real. But it looks real. There's a few things that we didn't put a lot of effort into, like the alternator and stuff. You can tell it's computer generated. But everything came from that computer file. So now um, the process where like auto conversion engine, no. The auto conversion thing, if you were to, to replace everything like we did, like an oil pan with a CNC machine pan instead of 25 pounds, now it weighs three. The valve cover weighs four pounds of plastic. We CNC machine it out of aluminum and it weighs one. The, the back chain cover for the engine that has the, the, the chain for the camshaft, all redesigned, digitized, and machined out of billet in order to get a true airplane engine Means, which means not a car engine with a bunch of castings and brackets bolted to it to mount it to an airplane, but an actual rear part of the engine that has eight aviation style mounting points in it. So the only thing that was used from the Honda was what people want, what they trust, which is the drivetrain, the, the long block. Um, so that's how that developed and went. And then, then the next thing was, okay, gearboxes, belt drives, whatever, what's going to drive a prop? And the most popular question is, well, that gearbox is not going to last, there's issues with belts, there's this, there's that. So I'm thinking, well, the one thing that we got to have, or I, I wanted, was a gearbox. I don't want a belt. Seems simple on the surface, and I could spend 10 minutes talking about why I would use a belt drive ever again, even though it works. But I just to shorten that part down, I wanted something where you turn the key and you fly. You no know, tinkering with adjusting bells or tension or tracking or black dust or none of that. I just wanted so that's what that's why everybody uses a gearbox. You know, if you buy you buy a car, it's got gearboxes on it. You buy machinery, it's got gearboxes on it. Now you can get gears. Gears are available, hardware stores, uh, gear manufacturers, uh, you can find a transfer case somewhere, get gears out of it, modify them. Well, I was faced with something that needed to be lighter or have the same horsepower to weight ratio of a 912 Rotex, and that's it's not easy. So now taking a, a gear out of an existing machine and converting it or machining it or making it work in your own gearbox is a waste of time and money, and it's never going to turn out the way you want it to do it anyhow. So again, we, we hired uh, gear uh, engineers that do only gears, and we had a gear set designed and drawn in CAD. And then I designed the housing for it, and the cooling system for it, and the dampening system for it. A real nice dampener that we have between the engine and the gearbox. But the gears were professionally designed by 
by someone that that's all they do. And it's quite interesting when you get involved in it because a gear can be something with teeth or it can be something with teeth that cost you know, $1,000 for a little gear. And there's a huge difference in the processes and the materials and the hardening and the stress relieving and the grinding of these gears and, and uh, it's just and the type of alloy you start out with. And, and we use absolutely, like you see some parts down on our table there, we don't take, we don't cut corners on anything. The gears are like the best we can make, the best alloys, the best companies making them. Uh, they're the most expensive parts in our engine. Uh, the big gear is like $600 and the small gear is like $400. And they're designed to, they're implementing all the things that have to be part of such a gear in order to keep the gearbox weight down, which means it has to have the bearing lands, it has to have the gear itself, it has to have the inputs flying, Drop that is driven by the coupling, it, and it has to have a top gear that's a single piece where you can put a propeller on and so forth and so on. If you start putting together all these things out of sub-assemblies, then it gets weaker, uh, heavier, and non-professional. So that covers the gearbox. Uh, as far as the engine itself, I covered all the machine parts. We do that to make it lighter. Uh, we don't that's the weight. The total weight of the engine is 178 pounds, and that's without oil and cooler. And it takes about a gallon of oil and about a gallon of cooler. It's a little more coolant if you're running an automotive style heater or any kind of heater. Uh, as far as installing the engine, once it's done, the way we sell them uh, are firewall forward only, which means, well, not only, if somebody wants to do it themselves as far as build their own mount, they can. But in general, we sell an engine for a 701, for a 750, for a 601, 650 RB12, the, 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 the uh, Sonics, um, we do the kit Fox, we do gyroplanes, we do power parachutes, all those things. Now, you ever done a C Ray? And we did one C Ray, it was unsuccessful. Yeah, we claim it's not our fault. But we had, it was really nobody's fault. We put a C Ray engine on. A builder's plane where he really wasn't ready to be part of the whole it was an it was an experiment and he was uh, really uh, uh, nothing wrong with him nothing wrong with us but once it was mounted it, it didn't work right out of the box it needed some tweaks little adjustments here and he didn't want to be part of that because he felt like he was getting older and just wanted to fly so he decided well then you might not be the right guy. And we shifted that development to another person up in Milwaukee, Chris Lane, and he is now finished with this plane, and it has all the things that we learned on the C-Ray uh, implemented on the next C-Ray. I have What's that? I have an engine working on the C-Ray. Well, he is not. The second one is not flying yet. Oh, the first one, uh, the CG wasn't perfect. The engine had to be moved forward. There was something wrong with the airplane where it, it always needed full down trim. We don't know why. Uh, and there was no, not enough time to do any tweaking on it. Yeah. So we just, the whole thing got abandoned and we moved on to the, to the next builder and he got it a road back and put it up, which they have already all the pieces and stuff for that. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be interesting now with Chris flying because the, the, the reason the C-Ray, the C-Ray is not important to me as far as any kind of sales. I've sold a lot more gyroplane engines and power parachute engines and Zenit engines than we'll ever sell to the C-Ray. Right. The reason the C-Ray is interesting is because it's the high, it's the biggest challenge. The C-Ray is, is heavy. It has a aft CG issue, which you know they're coping with. It's not a problem with the airplane. It's a great flying airplane. It needs all the power you can get, you know, to get out of the water with two people and. And all the weight that's associated with the hull and everything, and then trying to cool it up there, and so all those things worked. The Sea Ray that we flew, in, and this guy's name was Tom, it flew perfect. It would be looked fine on the outside. There was just no tweaking uh, time allowed because he wasn't interested in that. How much horsepower did you put that? 110. And then uh, uh, let's see. So that was a Sea Ray. Uh, any other installation uh, questions would be like something like. What we have done, uh, not by choice, but it just happened to be that way, 
as soon as we had the engine finished, we would get customers that wanted us to install the engine. But back then, there wasn't a whole lot of data on our website. So we did a 701, turned out beautiful. Took off in 60 feet, uh, flies excellent, um, CG is fine, um, and we documented everything. Took pictures of every little move that we made, part numbers for other stuff that you would need, like wires and fuel fittings and where to put the pumps, and we put that on our website. Then we did, uh, then we did the Highlander, same thing, lots of pictures, and we're doing another one right now to add pictures to that, and now we just did a 750. These were all done by us, and which was nice, because we could get all the data that we, or the information that we wanted to put both in the DVD that's available through Home Built Health. He has a professional DVD of how to put a, install a seat, um, an engine, a Viking in any kit plane. So, Documentation has become extremely important. Like what I was saying in the beginning about the history of the Subaru versus this, when we'll, number one is making a very professional engine. Number two is having excellent documentation. And number three is to have 24 hour online help like through our forum. And that way, there, and, and my goal is to have engines that go out that actually fly. We're not gonna have any of this where it's so hard to install the engine that some builder gives up on his plane and his or her plane and it sits in a garage and it never flies. Okay, so the engine is is gonna is designed in a way that's the least hassle of the whole plane. Because you get to the end, you're already tired of building and you want something that goes in easy. So we added some products for that too. We we realized that if we wanted to have the wire schematic that we would like to have, that we would have to do it ourselves because it, it's a tail. Well, a lot of people can read our schematic and say, okay, he wants me to have a relay over here and some fuses over here and two switches and, and this and that. But some people can't and they don't want to learn how to wire. So we made a little module ourselves that gives you the backup system. So when you're flying on the primary side, because we have backup to everything, and something happens, you're not going to be like fiddling with looking at the fuel pressure or the temperature or see what was wrong. You're just going to go to backup. And when you go to backup, uh, it shuts off the primary, and you're on your backup computer, you're on your backup fuel pump, you got all new fuses or breakers for the whole airplane, uh, and your alternator, and so now, it's, so then you then you troubleshoot on the ground, you know. So that's the key with the electrical system is that um, since the engine does need electricity, that has to be perfect, and there has to be backup to it. So rather than troubleshooting in flight. What have I not covered? Probably a bunch, right? What do you say was the weight? 178 empty. Okay, and what about 110? Yeah. And the price was? It's $13,500. And this is an informative session, so we're not going to go too into much of the selling and stuff, but sure. that's what we're charging. Right. Um, and it's fire forward. Now, for someone that's building a power parachute and they don't want, you know, they don't want a radiator, they don't want maybe our oil cooler, they want to do their own, maybe a bigger radiator, thinner radiator, or whatever, they can buy the engine without all those extras, and it gets less expensive. So, any other questions? Did you, did you get it? The gentleman to uh, the earlier session was talking about the prop, so I'm Sonic because you have a smaller diameter. The Sonics, uh, like the Sonics and the One X, like the One X will be the first one to fly with a Viking, probably prior to any Sonics. The Sonics crowd has been different than everybody else. With the 701, 750, uh, RV12, it was always like, I'll give you my plane, you put an engine in. Everybody's anxious to see one fly and everything. With the Sonics, everything's been different. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to be the first one. Yeah. And, well, well, <laughs> and I don't know why, but it's more different. Prop, I, I forget the diameter of the prop, but it's small. It's been the smaller prop. Because right. It's so like, so prop. what I'm saying is, I'm getting to that. What happened was, I had to do the research on the prop, which is fine. So what I ended up, we ended up with a 1X in our shop, which is very similar to Sonics. And we're like, okay, uh, got lots of horsepower here. We have a geared engine. We have somehow, we have to absorb this thrust. And, uh, and we don't like two blade propellers on the geared engine. You'll see like 99% of the Rotax is two. They put three 
blades on, and that's because it's smoother. It's smoother on a geared engine to use a three-bladed prop. So we contacted Sensenich. Uh, they did have, I, I've been dealing with Steve at, at Plant City for many, many years. He had uh, a blade that turns the direction that we needed to turn, which is the same as the VW, or the Aero-V, left turning. So that solved the blade problem. So it's the same exact blade that's on the Aero-V, but with a hub that can, that was actually designed in Germany by Limbach. They needed a hub for their engine, which takes me to the Chinese thing where they bought all of our stuff. They just bought Limbach now, which uh, you guys might not be that familiar with, but that's, that was a German VW conversion company with certified VWs for many, many years. So they got, what they got? Limbach, they bought, they bought Continental, they bought Cirrus. Yeah, the helicopter. Yeah, it just goes on. <laughs> But back to the propeller. So we got three blades of the same size as for the VW. And if we still need more blade area, then the only thing we can do is machine our own hub for a four blade. So you're not, you're not sure how that's going to work yet? Uh, most likely, from the, from the calculations we've done, it's going to work out fine. Meaning that uh, static RPM, you're going to be cavitating the propeller initially, slightly. And then as the airplane accelerates, it's, uh, it unstalls and it'll accelerate and you'll get the real good speed out of it. So, any other questions? Does the 72 inch come at that price? The length of the prop doesn't really change the price of it. So, like if you want a 72 inch warp drive propeller, the least expensive one is a straight blade, no protection on the leading edges, what they call a low horsepower blade, which has less carbon in it, and on and on, and that's like an eight hundred dollar propeller. As soon as you go with a taper blade, nickel edges, a high horsepower version of the blade, Mr. Price, put contact around. You're right out at sixteen hundred dollars. So you get it's more than twice as expensive to get warp drives best stuff versus the least expensive stuff. And we always just buy the best one. We just buy the taper tip, nickel edge. Anyone else? What's the lead time now on work? August 20th. And then after August 20th, we'll have uh, engines on the shelf too for purchase, like directly. Or if somebody wants us to ship one out in a couple of days, then we can. If you place an order, how specific do you need to be on when you want it? Well, right now, the, it's either August 20th or, uh, or any time after. All AP students should be dismissed at this time. You did the, uh, like you said, you did all the all the, the work for like a lot of Zeners and stuff like that, like Sonics. I, it's know, the same thing we did. Because well, I know that you, you mount the, the fuel pumps in the in the uh, engine compartment. Or the, no, we never do that. I just thought because there's not a lot of room in the. It's the same. That's why we're doing a one X because if we can fit it in a 1X, then nobody has any excuses anymore. I want to just ask you, you've never done it, but you've never done it yet. There's no, we haven't. There's not a lot of room in the, in the under the, the fuel tank is, is right in your, your lap and then the rudder pedal. The owner of the 1X that we have in our shop now, it's actually in the shop next door, he um, told me about, I, I think I've seen an article on these things, but you can buy, you can either make your own, or you can buy these pre-made uh, access openings. And the, the guy that sells them, uh, sells them with a, with a frame for the back, with has enough plates and everything. So you can make a, an opening and then put this thing in there and it'll be flush. And it's designed in such a way that you can do it almost anywhere on your airplane and you get this, you get more strength after than before, I mean, even with this, uh, this cover. And so the one X we're doing will have one on each side, right behind the firewall. So if you take these two covers off, now you got clear access all the way through by the firewall, rudder pedals, to work in there, to put in, install fuel pumps or whatever. Are you buying your engines from Honda? No, we don't, we're not buying right from Honda. We're buying, uh, we're, we're actually buying 2012 salvage cars right now. Stuff, cars that were hit on the side, cars that were hit on the back, cars that rolled over, um, anything where the engine wasn't and then all that gets taken apart, everything
ingots. Um, this is the final boarding call for the buses. Final call. Everything gets inspected, and then it gets we we um, uh, grade the parts. It's either it's a, a new part as far as for our engine, if it meets all new criteria, or we throw it out. So that's how we work it. Basically, you use the parts to build a new engine. Everything is in. If it doesn't meet new, new standards, as far as what we, what, you know, our new standards, then we don't use it. A what? An RM inspection repair is necessary. Yeah, but it's uh, it doesn't meet overhaul standards. It meets new standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Dismissed. <laughs>